Thank you all for being here. I'm Cynthia Christina. I'm the color line investigator here, but I'm also a member of the Black Leadership Coalition. And I want to thank you all for showing up for this event. I think we're going to have a fantastic event tonight. Um, we've had a whole series of events starting in mid-February. We have a few other events coming up as well. And so there's a card for one. And on your table, you'll see the little yellow cards. They have a QR code that will uh, take you to a page that shows all of our events. So if you have an interest in some of our events coming up in the future, please take a look at that page and, and see what might interest you. Tonight, I appreciate so much interest in our guests. Dr. Sean Anderson, who's a professor at Loyola Marymount University, and he is going to talk to us a little bit about sports as activism. So I'm not going to talk too much. I'm going to let Dr. Anderson introduce himself a little bit. But thank you so much. Please be prepared to ask questions and engage and, and get as much out of this opportunity as you can. Dr. Anderson. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Dr. Sean Anderson. I am a professor, senior professor at Manuela Marymount University um, in Los Angeles. I had a short uh, hour flight up here this morning. I've uh, been at LMU now at the end of this semester, it'll be seven years. Okay. But as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from LA. <laughs> I am from the Deep South. Okay. okay. I am from the state that may have not heard of. Uh, Arkansas, <laughs> uh, born and raised. Um, I'm about five hours from New Orleans, Louisiana. And so growing up, I got to a lot of trouble with Mardi Gras. <laughs> so if you have never been to Mardi Gras, I suggest that you do it. All right? You'll have a good time. So in the style, sports, particularly football, is king. Yeah. Okay. If you were not playing sports, you were ostracized right, by the community. And so I pretty much played sports here and there for a majority of my junior high and high school years. Primarily because you know, I wanted to be with my boys. You know what I'm saying? I, I wanted to enjoy life with them. I didn't want to be left out thinking about a 60 year old kid who wouldn't, right? And so but I still had this other interest. You know, I, I was thinking like, okay, why do I have to play all these years? Why can't I own a team? You know, or why is it that people worship sports? I wanted that understanding. And so much of that actually came from my grandfather, who I had in my life in my first 11 years. And he was a big baseball fan. But he was also... Uh, I watch a lot of political shows all the time. So imagine this eight-year-old kid, you know, being around this, this old black man telling me to wake up at six o'clock in the morning and him to watch news and then watch sports. And an old soul coming up. And so the one thing that he actually said to me a few years before he passed away was that you got to see the bigger picture in life. You know, you see the sports stuff, you see people play it. Why can't you be an agent? Why can't you be somebody that studies it? Why can't you be someone that looks at sport from a different angle? So I kind of took that to heart. And so, you know, I grew up, um, again, I played sports. I was getting pretty good. You know, I was getting letters, but I, you know, I wasn't the best out there. You know, I was, I was, if I put my heart into it, I could have, I could have done some things. <laughs> but it was a knee injury, actually, that, that, that saved me. Um, I'm going to gross you all out. <laughs> but <laughs> I got this injury when a helmet hit my kneecap and washed it out of place. <laughs> And so I think I was stunned for like the first 10 minutes. But then after that, I started crying. I think that's the hardest I've ever cried. I looked at it and it was just black, mess, swelling up. And so naturally, the playing days were over. Okay. But then I had another interest. 
I was like, okay, if I can't play, which I'm low key kind of glad I, I, I'm not playing, I wanted to be the next Stuart Scott. So, for those of you who don't know, Stuart Scott uh, is the late uh, sport broadcaster for ESPN, really made it popular to kind of infuse a lot of slang into talking about sports. And so I said, I want to do that. And so, I went to undergrad, um, got my degree in broadcast journalism, um, worked as a sports producer for the local news for a couple of years, when I got my master's degree. And it was at that school, Arkansas State University, where the professor was like, hey, you have a knack for research. You should consider going to graduate school. So at that time, I was like, man, I'm just trying to make some money. You know that's <laughs> And so it <laughs> turns out I got a job as a, at a consulting firm in Dallas, Texas. The recession hit, I had to go back home. And so I actually was like homeless for like eight months before I went back to my mom's house. Same professor hit me up and said, you should go and pursue a PhD. I was like, well, what do I have to lose now? <laughs> so I pursued a PhD at West Virginia University in 2013. And struggled my first semester. Um, but after that, um, I got introduced to a professor who studied sports, the way I wanted to study it, and the rest was history. And so I got so good at it that I was able to work with Major League Baseball for my dissertation. Okay. So Major League Baseball was trying to introduce these initiatives to bring more black kids into the game. And so they were saying, we are struggling. Could you help us do the research? And again, that turned into my dissertation. Mm -hmm. um, what I found in the study was that base, Major League Baseball is full of, uh, you know, I don't know why they curse, but they were full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, they had all these programs, but they didn't know how to measure it. They didn't even try to measure it. Um, when I asked them about the success of these programs, they couldn't tell me, but they had no data to back up the usefulness of these programs. And so they got me thinking, maybe this is not just major league baseball, maybe it's all of the other leagues that are out there. So after I graduated in 2016, got the position at LMU, I've been studying that for the last seven or so odd years. And so wrote papers and book chapters, and it culminated in this book that I just published back on February. Book launch and a birthday party. We got we got right. And so this book is called The Black Athlete Revolt, The Sport Justice Movement in the Age of Black Lives Matter. What does that mean? He believed that it's been 10 years since the hashtag Black Lives Matter was introduced. Okay? We've seen a lot of shifting things in our society since that time. But what has been a complex situation is the understanding of sport and politics. Okay. In chapter one, I call this sort of connection an unholy maximum. Okay. We know that when it comes to relationships, marriage, there are great times, there are bad times, uh, there are people telling you to leave this person, people telling you to stay. All of this stuff occurs. So I juxtapose that to the concept of sport and politics. But many people think that the concept of sport and politics started in the civil rights movement. As we know, the civil rights movement um, ended about 70 years ago, 60, 70 years ago. But sport and politics was out well before that. But where can we trace it? 
So I'll go back 10 years after the Civil War. Right? 1875, 10 years into Reconstruction. What was happening during that time? Well, Black people will continue the promise of the 40 acres and mule, right? But there was nothing coming out of that. But then there was a way that social economic justice kind of came about. So in 1875, the Kentucky Derby was established. Right? So if you're talking about gang or people riding horses, during the late 1800s, who do you think were the people who rode the horse? Well, it was the people who used to run the stables. Okay? We know the term cowboy. We think about guns are blazing, big hats, riding on horseback. But that term was created for the person who ran the stables. Okay? So they round up a few cowboys, established this game, and over the next 15 years, these athletes became the equivalent of what we know today as millionaire athletes. <laughs> Many people probably never heard of them. So they were doing good. They were helping families, they were building a life, you know, establishing things, saving money. But then a court case landed in 1896 that changed all of that. Now, this court case wasn't necessarily established because of these athletes, but it had a major effect on how, again, they earned money. So we're talking about the Plessy versus Ferguson case that said we're separate but equal. We enter into early 1900s, and by 1911, these players were obsolete. It became so bad for some of them that there was a story of one black jockey who lost it all. He used the last of his money, went into a pawn shop, bought a gun, and shot himself right there. And that's not the only tragedy you know, of these type of athletes. So we're centering the world of sport and politics again. Unbeknownst to these athletes, around the late 1800s, 1896, so on and so forth. But we saw another sort of rise in the early 1900s. It was the black intellectual. So W.E.B. Du Bois, which if you have not gone to Ghana, if you've never had the opportunity to go, you should. They have his museum there because he moved there the last years of his life before he passed away. I was able to see his entire collection of books, their originals. And right across from the house that he lived, his burial site. So going there sort of kind of opened my mind to a lot of stuff. And this is right when I got my position at Fayette America. But I digress. W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, a famous journalist, Booker T. Washington, all of these people rose out of the mud to try to set the new world order for Black America. And so they had agendas. They didn't all agree with each other, but they all agreed on Black liberation. But there was another person at the end of the fray, too, whose name is Marcus Garner. Okay, now he's important in the aspect of sport and politics for this reason. Whereas all of these other leaders were like, you know, yes, we need freedom, we need integration, you know, we need to get rid of segregation. He was like, no, nah, we need to go back to Africa. We can repatriate. That's what he called it. The Pan Africanist movement, he tried to establish became world-renowned at the time, okay? But another sports figure rose during the same era. His name was Jack Johnson, okay? 
Muhammad Ali talked about Jack Johnson. He said, I know I'm bad, but he was crazy. Okay, let me explain. So Jack Johnson grew up in Texas. Um, kind of taller than most of his peers. I think he was around six foot four. Um, and his final height, about 230 solid. But as a kid, you know, still bigger than the rest. They would get into a lot of these legal boxing matches uh, where basically he would win all of them. And they would do these boxing matches in these events that a lot of white promoters put together. All right. He got money on the table uh, to win these bouts. And so naturally, the boxing world was not ready for a black champion. Okay. But he wanted to change that. So as he got old enough to talk his shit, he went around and followed the heavyweight champion of the world at the time for two years, whether he fought in the U.S. or whether he fought across the globe. He said, well, the only reason why you got this championship is because you haven't fought me. Right. And so a promoter actually put a fight together. And he won. He won the fight. And why did we let him do that? In the South, there is this culture of uh, teeth joy. We call them goals. But it's a, it's a staple. I got a pair. So my mom's got a pair. You know, I wanted to rock in the day. I ain't know. <laughs> But Jack Johnson wore these with pride everywhere he went. And Jack Johnson uh, wore furs. He bought the most expensive cars. He had at least 20 girlfriends at the same time for most of his life. And about three wives. Okay, And he let the world know that I'm here to stay, you can't do nothing about it. And so, as his popularity grew, so did Marcus Garvey's. So much so that African leaders, when asked, who are the most famous black people you know in the Western Hemisphere? They said Marcus Garvey and Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson was not a political leader. He pretty much said he didn't care about politics, but he was very bold in his communication. You know, he walk up to white men and punch them in the stomach, and he didn't even get away with it. But then there arose this concept called the great white hope. And we've heard this term loosely to some degree. But the great white hope was this communication that the boxing world had to any boxer that was coming up. We need to get rid of this black man. And you, white person, need to make that happen. He was flaunting. He was showing up. He was interrupting uh, other events just to tell people, I'm the heavyweight champion. There's nothing you can do about it. In 1910, the Man Act was established. What is that? Well, the Man Act was a rule that says that anyone who transports white women or white girls across state lines will be arrested and could face the death penalty. Okay? This is two years after he won his heavyweight title. Why was this law established? You can't, of course, necessarily say that he was the main reason, but if you're someone that the whole world hates at this point in time, you got to find a way to get rid of him. And so, of course, he went across state lines, he was arrested, and he had a choice, either to serve jail time or flee the country. So he fled. And he was gone for a few years, never relinquishing the title because they didn't have the rule at the time. 
But he came back and he had to serve. So at the time that he, well, after he finished serving, they found the great white hope that eventually beat him. But this person was, I believe, 25 years old in their prime. He was close to 40, you know. And when he lost, it was as if it was jubilation all across the planet. And after that, Jack Johnson kind of went into obscurity and unfortunately passed away in a, in a car accident. But that was another instance of sport politics. And even though he was not a political person, these acts were passed. Another figure that rose out of this was Paul Rose, who was definitely an activist. A scholar, an athlete, an actor. Many people don't know about him. Paul Robeson, um, at the time he made it to college at Rutgers, he was the highest achieving academic there. A black man. He was also the best athlete at the school. All American. Super, super intelligent. He graduated. He got accepted at Columbia University Law School, the best in the there. Of course, the NFL was established, but to pay his way to law school, he played professional football. Once he finished law school, he couldn't practice. Why? Because of Jim Crow. So he took his other talents in acting and went into theater and had a story career um, in theater and acting. But he also became an activist, a uh, 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 global activist about liberation and freedom. The U.S. government got tired of him and revoked his passport and said, you can no longer perform here or in other countries. So for almost a decade, he lost everything. And he went into obscurity. But Paul Robeson was important because Paul Robeson was the person who mentored Bayard Rustin. Who was Bayard Rustin? Bayard Rustin was an architect in the civil rights movement. So we know of MLK, we know of Malcolm X, we know of Fannie Payment, but we don't know of Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin was the one who taught MLK how to protest. He came up with a strategy for the March of Washington to Selma and all other factors of the civil rights movement. We don't know his name because at the time, people who were openly gay couldn't be at the forefront mm. of the movement. And so as such, they told him to take a back seat. But Paul Robeson had a, again, a trajectory into the civil rights movement. Bayard Rustin led a lot of initiatives. He was the one that also mentored Bill Russell, Jim Brown. He had conversations with Muhammad Ali, who was my favorite athlete of all time. As he talked his talk, he walked his walk. But one of the things that transpired near the end of the civil rights movement was Muhammad Ali's uh, avoidance of the Vietnam War. So what many people don't know is that he had dyslexia. And that's why he you know, was functionally illiterate. But the uh, US government gave him a greater A anyway, because they were like, OK, he talks a lot. He's a heavyweight champion. We need to get rid of this guy. Hopefully, he'll die in war. So he avoided it. And again, another athlete who lost that trajectory because of politics. Many people blame that situation as to why he got parties. Because he had to change his whole boxing style after he returned. And he created this thing called the rope -a which is basically keep getting hit to the body, wear out your opponent, 
and then attack. Okay? And that cost. So it was during that time when we saw the height of athletes engaging in activism, and it culminated with the 1916 Olympics protests, where we saw the Black Power Fist. But then what happened? The U.S. government shut things down. There was a period of dormancy, and then there was a period of financial gain within sports. So in 1984, Los Angeles hosted the most profitable Olympics of all time, <clears throat> amassing almost $300 million in revenue for 1984. So sports leagues then began to say, oh, man, that's a lot of money in sports. And we need to build our games around individuals instead of teams. And so that's why we saw the introduction of the Air Jordan, these commodities to make athletes millionaires, to make owners even rich. The caveat was, you be quiet, you earn money, we earn money, everybody wins. And so that was the move for the next 25, 30 years. But then, the world said, enough is enough when it came to a lot of issues in our society. It loosely began in 2008 when we saw Occupy Wall Street. When the recession hit, everybody was losing jobs. People were saying enough is enough. A few years later, we had the Black Lives Matter movement. And that was really the catalyst to athletes becoming revitalized and activists. So that was the Hands Up Don't Shoot demonstration in 2014. Um, there was the Missouri football team in that same year who were protesting a lot of the issues on campus. And these players said, if you don't get rid of this president, we're going to forfeit games. And they got rid of their president because they didn't want to lose their football money. Right? And so, 2016, we saw the big explosion of athlete activism, Colin Kaepernick, him being blackballed from the NFL. But 2020 is when we established the sport justice movement. Okay, because there was a multitude of athletes at this point who were saying, and high profile athletes at that, who were saying, yes, these protests matter, but we need to get into conversations on policy reform and policy change. Okay. Athletes have taken the mantle to try to make the world a better place. They've been doing it for over 100 years. But the sport justice movement is something that is launched from the Black Lives Matter movement as a platform to really pursue change, pursue opportunity. Pursue economic justice, pursue DEI justice, in many of those cases. So athletes are no longer saying we're not going to, you know, just play. We're not going to shut up and drug. We're going to create schools, we're going to build our own businesses, we're going to represent ourselves when it comes to uh, the money that they earn. And we're going to create our own media to talk about the things that we do. So the sport justice movement is in its infancy. But it's showing strength in how we can change society and legislation and voting. We're calling out these leagues to push the agenda for social justice. This book takes us through the history it takes us to the dormancy and it takes us to the future where sports can lead us in our society. Thank you for listening to me. I'm ready for any questions and I'll let you move forward. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. 
And um, if you want to have a seat, we'll keep this a little informal. Um, first, wonderful talk. I, I feel like I always learn something new. Um, and I'm an avid sports fan myself. Yep. So we talked a little bit earlier yep. um, about um, sports and activism and social justice. Um, first, I want to ask if anyone in the audience um, have questions. We do have um, curated questions, but if you have a specific question, yeah. What is that? What was that? Well, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us today. Um, I'm curious, what professional sports league do you feel actually backs up their talk the most? So I know every sports league, they have their marketing slogans. Everyone wants to fly like the Black Lives Matter fly as a logo. Mm-hmm. Who do you think actually likes is backing up what they say the most? I know I'm sure there's room to go for all of this, but I think. That's a great question. I think the NBA, um, the WNBA actually. Uh, well, yeah, I'll say the WNBA, and here's why. Renee Montgomery is a former WNBA player who called out her former team's owner for denouncing the Black Lives Matter movement. They pushed that agenda so much that that owner gave up ownership. And Renee Montgomery put a team together and bought the team. I don't see any other athletes out there making that type of change. Mm -hmm. And she um, is also very active in voting rights, um, education rights, um, but also on the platform to show athletes how they can leverage their power beyond the play to get into business, Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is something that is really great. I would say the NBA will probably be a, a close second because their commissioner is a player's commissioner. When they had the, the, the bubble games during COVID and the athletes were like, we're not going to play because of the latest police brutality shooting. Um, he was like, OK, let's sit down. Let's have a conversation. Instead of just saying, no, you're going to play to make us money. And that's better than any other commissioner that's out there right now. Because on the flip end of that, when, for any of you all who don't know who DeMar Hamlin is, Buffalo Bill safety basically had a heart attack on the field. Mm -hmm. And it took them an hour almost to say, okay, we're going to cancel this game. Because it was just going to be a situation where they just take him to the hospital and resume. That's not, that's not a good look. So they saved themselves, but there still was an issue. Why such a delay? So I think it's in those categories. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question. If you could just talk about athletes, but we're seeing more so particularly uh, black athletes, yeah. they just have an agency of their own body. Sure. And I'm really thinking about um, the Fab um, Five yeah. and being at Michigan and just how revolutionary it was for them to be playing and freshmen and how they were unapologetic of who they were. So if you could talk about that, I really appreciate it. Yeah. No, the Fab Five was, was oh, that was, that was a great era. Um, but you know what? The Fab Five, they talked in a recent interview that they were thrown under the bus uh, a lot from some of the things that they received as athletes, you know, college sports athletes get a lot of stuff, but they were duped into a lot of deals, you know, by coaches, by agents, and they took the blame. Okay. So that's that agency kind of going away. We were talking earlier about the intelligence of black athletes and the NFL. And I believe they changed this. I want to say it was maybe two years ago, two or three years ago, where they used to do these sort of internal studies on the intelligence of black athletes. And they came to the conclusion 
that black people were less intelligent. Okay. And they used that criteria when they drafted players to certain positions. And so when that news became availed in the media, they finally said, okay, we need to fire this person <laughs> who's been doing all these studies. We were wrong and we need to do better. So think about that though. That has been going on for years. You know, the concussion issues have been going on for years. And if it wasn't broadcasted, we still would have these problems. So relative to the agency of black athletes, it's, it's growing, it's becoming better. But man, the history of it, it's so deep and so ingrained, it's gonna take some time to recover. Just like with any other situation of abuse. So does that answer your question? Thank you, yes. Yeah. Do we have any other obvious questions? I can't remember. Uh, first off, thank you for being here. Um, learning about all of these professional athletics and teams and organizations, I'm curious about how, where does college athletics play into the athletes? Great question. I think the, the NIL deal has really changed the game. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. I told people this. The NCAA is going to find a way to fight back against that. Typically, when it comes to the NCAA president, they hire presidents of schools to lead that institution. For the first time ever, they hired a lawyer. Okay? Why is that? Why did Jeff Bezos buy the Washington Post, <laughs> the, the, the largest political newspaper in the U.S.? If you want to, you know, share the narrative, then you would buy the paper. So the NCAA came up with the term student athlete back during the Civil Rights Movement to keep athletes from suing because of injury and to establish the amateurism of it all, okay? Now, athletes, even back then, student athletes fought back or tried their best to fight back against it, right? Um, but I believe that the, the NIL situation changed the landscape because previous lawsuits against the NCAA particularly this Ed O'Bannon case back in 2014, said that you're profiting, you're making billions off our likeness in these video games that you're putting out there. Mm -hmm. So the NCAA said, well, instead of paying you, we're just going to get rid of these video games altogether. So how about that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they just started back with these games because of the NIL. What athletes today, I believe, should do is to keep a lawyer on retainer because they're trying to change those rules all the time. Um, they're trying to cap how much athletes can earn. Um, they're trying to say that if you are a part of a collegiate institution and you're earning money, you got to put it back into the system. They're trying to make these changes. So keep a lawyer on retainer as much as, much as you can and try to follow the trends of the NCAA because they're trying to change that narrative with this lawyer who is the president right now. Hi, thank you for coming. I like your conversation. Thank you. I'm new to this sport arena, so yep. I'm going to tell you what I know. Um, I've seen a lot of, I guess when the, the football players, they get injured, they take them back and they give them a shot, mm -hmm. and then they roll them right back out and they say, oh, he's back. So can you give a little background on that? Like they give them this shot and are they they still injured, but they're gonna play or yeah. So that's a great question. So they usually try to do that to numb the pain. Um yeah. a lot of these athletes also kind of run off adrenaline. So they'll say, No, I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna get out game. Just just shoot me up, just shoot me up, you know, with whatever steroid or performance enhancer that they have. And they will go out and play. But then after their career is over, you know, um, 
some players probably won't be able to walk again, you know, because of the, the constant trying to have them play, you know, to earn money. But that's the thing about ownership, too, that I have a problem with because Jerry Jones, who was the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, is 80 years old. You know, nobody's told him that he has to give up this team. But each year they evaluate players. They get rid of those who continue to get injured. They bring in a new crop. But he's going to pass down his legacy to his kids, whereas these athletes, after three or four years, are thrown away. It's always a what can you do for me now situation. You know, um, there are so many athletes that they don't talk about who even haven't been in the league long enough to earn a pension to help them in their health recoveries. Um, there was a, a player, um, he was a quarterback at Iowa State University. His name is Antoine Randall. They switched him to wide receiver, again, because of that rule. He couldn't be intelligent enough to play a quarterback position. And he was in the league for 10 years, kept getting hit in the head. Two years later, he couldn't remember his name. And he's just under constant supervision at this point. And he's not even 40 years old. So all of that is about the culture of winning, the culture of these owners wanting to continuously make money. You know, the Dallas Cowboys are the worst, <laughs> one of the worst franchises in the NFL, but they are the highest value team by a lot. They are, I think they are worth $3 billion more than the next team. They all are about the marketing. They're all about America's team. And if you can't fit that mantra because you're injured, you're out. That's just what it's all about. And so that's why these athletes, in many cases, feel like they have to pump themselves up with all this stuff or they lose whatever money they have. So this is why we, it's like, the, you said, the million-dollar slave? Yes. So it's almost like you put them in a category of, like, race track, horse racing. Mm -hmm. You have to, if that horse doesn't win, then we're going to put you down. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that culture starts early. Yes. Athletes usually start young. So mm -hmm. just imagine it started from a child. I've got more questions. Dr. Anderson, in your book, First of all, you referenced a little bit about the, the protests and activism of the civil rights era. Mm -hmm. And in your book, and I haven't read it yet, but I got into it, I'm looking forward to it. It's all good. Because you said that you really examined how activism has shifted from that protest into uh, more having policy conversations, policy reform conversations. I have a two-part question. One is, how do those conversations get started, and who has to be at the table for those to be effective, if they are effective? Oh, it's a great question. So um, in one of the chapters, I actually conduct a lot of interviews with athletes, um, with lawyers, um, with grassroots organizations and national nonprofit organizations who work with sport teams. So one in particular is called the Vera Institute of Social Justice in New York. Um, they work with a lot of athletes on criminal justice reform. And um, they typically reach out to athletes and those who want to be committed to those type of movements, they'll work with them about the laws in certain, certain states across the U.S. Um, one person in particular, his name is Karan Butler, a, a multi-NBA all-star player. He's the current assistant coach with the Miami Heat. Um, he does a lot of criminal justice reform in the state of Connecticut. That's where he went to college. So uh, sorry for the people who <laughs> I, I will not mention the school, <laughs> but <laughs> which y'all should be happy. You know, you, you, you did a great job of getting to the tournament. <laughs> but, um, you know, don't feel bad because they, they beaten my uh, home state, Arkansas, down bad. Down bad. <laughs> Terrible. But he talks with that institute 
And he goes to a lot of trials, um, and understanding certain cases about people who may be um, a part of things such as like the Innocence Project. Um, he sits with lawyers and, and those who are trying to fight the you know, criminal justice system to talk like, how can I get involved as an athlete? How can I spread the message? How can I become involved? And many athletes are kind of taking that same path into any other type of cause that they want to get into. Colin Kaepernick, many people didn't talk about his Know Your Rights campaign um, website, where he is essentially going all across the country talking to youth about how they can prepare themselves just in case they make a stop by the police. Mm -hmm. And so he also listed all of the nonprofit agencies that he donated to um, with the remaining salary that he had in the NFL. So we're, we're seeing those types of things happening. It's just not talked about because the controversy is stop protesting, right? This is a great country. You shouldn't bash it. So those are the things that we're seeing. We still need some progress, you know, like the George Floyd Act needs to be, you know, actually passed. The Sandra Bland, all of these things are introduced, but we need to push the agenda further. So that's where we are, and but that's where we need to go. Um, are there any other audience questions before? I don't even know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you still read the Heritage? Or you read that oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Great book. Mm -hmm. Stuff in it. I think of the, the phrase uh, no ethical consumption under capitalism. Okay. So I'm thinking about the, the change of athletes at the time you're talking about, like Rose said, like uh, coming into you know, past Michael Jordan, now like LeBron era type yeah. athlete, right? So one of my concerns is someone has got an anti capitalist, right? Yes. To what level are athletes willing to actually put themselves on the line? I know owners make more money, that's much more evil in my mind, but still. I, I feel like the ability to say, I'm not going to play now, you're talking about the bubble, right? So Ron actually brought people together and said, you know, we've talked, we're going to play. Right? Yeah. Now, right, he got his Astros championship. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <Warrior fan. laughs> yeah. So okay. I just feel like there's a different level. So I think the policy thing is great, but yeah. I'm wondering your thoughts on, now it seems like there's a different incentive now for at least not to say, I'm not going to play. And now it's generational wealth. Right? Yeah. They don't have to have another job when they need like, to know that. They, mm -hmm. they can just live off this money. Um, and so to me, that I'm, I'm questioning what level then are athletes willing to put that on the line? Because that's a real, that's something we're really doing up, right? Yeah. Also, the great way to do the change, but sure. do you see a change now in, in what, where athletes are willing to kind of put themselves in terms of that level of You know, that's a great question. And that is a question that I have too, <laughs> because that's one of the things that I more or less are saying, okay, I think. They're being strategic in what they say uh, relative to what can happen when they say it. And, you know, I think it's no secret that LeBron, of course, wants that Jordan. I want to usurp Jordan. I want to be this billionaire athlete. You know, he wants that attention. It, 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 no doubt about it. You know, I, the thing is, on one end, it's great that he created his school and the school is doing, you know, well. But right. To what extent is he willing to give up everything? Because Muhammad Ali gave up everything at the height of his career and at the height of his money. I don't know if that will ever happen because. The amount of money in sports overall is big time. Um, we even have the United Nations. And this is actually the plot of my next book. So watch out for this. <laughs> in 2015, well, I'll take it back. They created the Sustainable Development Goals in which in 2030, they want to eradicate several, 17 different problems, namely poverty, um, education inequity, gender inequity, all of these things. And in 2015, they designated sports as this avenue to do that. And so the sport world is trying to figure out how to connect themselves to this. And I don't think 
you're doing a great job. So my goal, my next book is to build a framework that holds them accountable to that. So to answer your question, I'm still trying to figure that out. Thank you. I also don't know if I need a mic. I also don't know if I need a mic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, I will start by saying my best friend and her younger brother have a genetic knee problem where both their kneecaps will just go. So that was a fun experience in seventh grade for us. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm I'm struggling to figure out how to curate this question. Um, what do you think is like the missing piece for activism from black athletes in combat sports? Um, because you mentioned Muhammad Ali, um, and I'm obligated to ask this question because my husband coaches wrestling. So I'm thinking of like NCAA wrestling or even UFC in a sense of like what, you know, we haven't really seen anyone, right? So so what do you think is missing or is there something missing or I, that is an excellent question. I think it all stems from the popularity of the sport. Okay. So boxing used to be one of those things that we really want to see. For example, you know, we wanted to see uh, Floyd Mayweather, Mike Tyson back in his day. That was when boxing was in his glory days. Floyd Mayweather made it interesting, but it wasn't as big um, as, as, as that. Now boxing has been reduced to the Creed movies, right? <laughs> Which are good. You know, I mean, you know, yeah, oh yeah, I mean, yeah. a couple of them were, you know, okay. This one was all right. Um, but that makes boxing great for a moment, but not a lot of people have created that. Jordan name in these types of sports. Um, we just saw <laughs> the wrestling competition where the mom saw her son lose and she like tore up her glasses and threw him down and was crying. Mm-hmm. And but that was a moment, mm-hmm. right? So and then uh, the, the the one person that was um, talking about um giving his glory to god and then kind of oh, yeah. announcing other, other things yeah uh-huh. yep. so sport and religion is also a big thing too but again that's a moment <laughs> i think when we began to see the widespread growth of these sort of not other sports not to say that they're other sports but the sports that don't get as much attention then maybe you know we'll see see those shifts um, we saw the growth of UFC, so maybe there will be some stuff coming out of that at some point. But I, it's it's a popularity contest. Um, if, if, for example, if not a lot of black players are playing in the National Hockey League, then what's the point of them really talking about the issue, even though they got a lot of issues? So does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, I mean, there's a whole, like Donald Trump was also at the tournament, so that's a whole other issue right. to talk about. Yeah. Um, but I also, I mean, like Jordan, like Jordan Burroughs is really the only like combat sport icon that has held up for longer than a title fight, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, you, you are. I do agree with you, right? That it's it's the popularity, right? Because like now, it's 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 not saying that it's over, but you know. We're still pushing March Madness. <laughs> yeah. And and that's going to be something that's going to go for the next couple of weeks, which is going to, no pun intended, trump all of these other sport things that are going on. Yeah. So, does that answer yeah, your question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. oh okay. <laughs> I got to carry on the tradition now. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 for sure. First of all, I really appreciate it, like, this anti-capitalist question. Especially about the, the role of the Black millionaire. Yeah. And Du Bois' talents and all that. Yes. But I was wondering specifically to talk about the, the profit and the sin of the owner, mm-hmm. the ownership, and specifically the NBA bubble. Yeah. Where there are these studies that Black resistance are everywhere. Black Lives Matter was some towards. Yeah. You have teams like the Orlando Magic coming out and I can't read shirts. Right. And they're also owned by... The DeVos family. Yes. Intimately related to the Trump administration. And so part of that, I wonder about 
how do we navigate or how do we evaluate these initiatives that are implemented by leagues like the NBA? And how do we evaluate this risk of like the commodification or co-option of aesthetics of black statistics? Yeah. Ooh, that's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I was listening to this podcast um, the other day. It was Marie Smith, who is the National Football League Player Association Executive Director. And he posed a question. He says, these athletes tear up their bodies all season. One team survives, wins the Super Bowl, but the first person that touches the trophy is the owner. Why is that? That's his burning question. And he says the league calls him a bully for calling that type of situation out. Secondly, so the, the National Football League has increased their seasons by one game. <clears throat> but at the negotiation table with D. Maurice Smith and the owners, the owners were saying, okay, well, we actually want to extend the league season two games and we don't want to pay the players for those two games also we want to reduce or get rid of the pension for these players because they can earn money through endorsements and all of those things even though maybe it's a less than a quarter of the players on these teams collectively who earn the big money so what's going to happen to the rest? And so the, the issue becomes the structure of these leagues, because many of you may not have known, the NFL used to be a nonprofit organization that, that was the overseer of 32 profitable businesses. <laughs> and so... <laughs> the NFL now has changed that policy, but the NFL donates a lot of money to specific parties. When you donate money, your constituency wants to be satisfied. And so no matter what happens, that's going to be the case. And then when you're talking about resistance, we need to see the shift in ownership. Um, Michael Jordan is considering selling the Charlotte Hornets. So he's going to be out. Who's going to take over? Um, a couple of years ago, no, about a year ago, I was teaching a class and one of my students was like crying really hard. I wasn't paying attention. I tried to ignore it. <laughs> not, not in the sense that she <laughs> I'm sorry let me rephrase that <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to call attention to her okay um, and she was kind of motioning and I was telling her you know go do what you need to do and so she asked because she talked to me after class I said okay so the first thing she said was my life is over I was like okay <laughs> what do I do with this? And I said, okay, well, what's the problem? You don't have to tell me everything, but you wanted to talk. Let's talk. My parents are having to sell their team. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? My parents own the Denver Broncos. No wonder they wanted to sell. <laughs> and I was like, who the hell am I teaching? You know what I'm what am I doing? What's happening? What am I doing with my life? This dip okay. And so she was saying that this was happening like soon. And so they have to prepare. They were going to earn a lot of money, but the legacy, right? Byron Allen, who is a black billionaire was in line to try to bid for this team. But when the Walmart family says that they want to do things, they do them. 
and they bought the Broncos, particularly um, the oldest son, which if any of y'all don't know, each sibling in the Walmart family is worth at least $10 billion. Must be nice. Hmm? I know, right? <laughs> and so I, I, I bring up that story to say we need to see those structures change, but how can you compete with that at this point? Mm -hmm. When can we get to a point to where, you know, if, if we're going to stay in this whole sort of capitalist country, when can it be used to the advantage and not where it's always trying to catch up? I think that's going to continuously be the barrier to the, the not purpose, but the outcome of that resistance, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I agree. So, yeah, it's we need to see those internal structures change, uh, the way that owners um, make rules, like the Rooney Rule, for example. <clears throat> the Rooney Rule is just a strong suggestion. It's not something that's going to like really change things. You you can interview a minority owner, but I mean a, a coach, but you don't necessarily have to hire them. Those are the things that we're facing against those types of. Does that answer your question? I think so. Welcome back. Uh, okay. um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I, I've got two questions. One yeah. is being about the NFL and seeing parallels with the draft pick, but they are transatlantic um, slavery. Yeah. Um, do you highlight that in your book, or did you see that in your research? Well. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's all good. Um, I don't talk about that as much, but I do highlight this this <clears throat> concept um, that came from another, I think, great book that has been out for the last few years called 40 Million Dollar Slaves. And so this was by former New York Times uh, journalist uh, William Roden, black guy. I think he's an adjunct at Arizona State now. He said that he came up with that title because there was a New York Knicks player named Larry Johnson at the time who was talking trash to a fan, one of the front row fans. And this fan was like, you know, just shut up and play. You know, I'm the one that, that pays your salary. So you're just a $40 million slave anyway. And so there's that connection to the draft, to any of these other sort of um, leagues outside of the NFL where there's been this sort of common law exploitation. And I think it was more egregious at the collegiate level um, than anything prior to the NIL deal. Um, years ago, there was this player at the University of Tennessee running back named Arian Foster. And um, he was saying that we won a football game. I rushed for over 100 yards. The crowd was cheering. But when me and my roommate got back to our rooms, we were hungry. He was saying that they, had, they haven't eaten in a couple of days. So the NCAA has weird rules. I don't know if they've changed a lot. But for example, you can eat a hot dog, but if someone gives you condiments, mustard, onions, that's a violation. Okay. And so Arian Foster said in his documentary that he called his coach at the time, he said, who drove a Lexus and said, hey, me and my roommate are very hungry. If you don't do something about this, we're going to go do something stupid. So the coach pulled up with about 30 tacos from Taco Bell, which was a violation. But, and if the NCAA would have found out about it, they would have gotten their scholarships taken away. 
for some nasty tacos. And so the, the concept of that sort of, like you say, slave trade, again, goes back to how those structures are put in place. Um, the NCAA is, 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 is being called antiquated at this point. It's still powerful, but it's lost a lot of leverage. And so we're seeing the tides change a little bit. Um, again, as athletes are kind of taking that career that they've had and trying to build other businesses, we're seeing that. But that exploitation is, is still there, but it's, it's, it's moving a little bit. That answers your question. Okay, that answers my question. Yes. Okay. I have another, uh, Go ahead. You did highlight a lot of male athletes. Um, did you have any that you were angry with that? Like, like small bios and turning going into black women that also were angry with? Yeah. So I gave uh, a whole testament to first the WNBA because mm -hmm. I, I that's one of my favorite leagues. <laughs> um, um, but then I took it back also to the civil rights movement and talked about Althea Gibson. And although she wasn't um, political per se, she was skilled at her craft and she made a lot of noise. And she was the Williams sisters before the Williams sisters. And um, she won a lot at Wimbledon. She was a multi-sport athlete. Um, we also talked about I actually interviewed um, the, she's at the University of Oregon right now, but she was the captain of the soccer team at USC who established the Black Lives Matter athlete coalition there that has been spreading across different college campuses. And so getting her perspective on times past and where things should go now. So I've made sure to, in this book, I also, we know about the prominent athletes, but I make sure to talk about those that we really didn't, we don't cover um, because it's, it's necessary to see how those athletes, although not necessarily known, were some of the early pioneers on policy before. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if you consider yourself a realist or an idealist, but this might expose you a little bit. Oh, um, I was wondering I'm here for presentations around some of the changes being proposed in terms of it seems performative yeah. and um, enough to like satiate the moments, but not the bigger picture. And yes. I was wondering if you feel like this change is possible without total reconstruction and deconstruction of what the sport franchise movement is mm -hmm. and like what the commodification was mentioned of like what an athlete is and who it is to yeah. us as like a country or a world. You know, I think I'm the type of person that believes that if there's not money to be made in certain situations, people are not going to involve themselves with it. Um, I say, for example, like even in the hip hop community, if there wasn't millions of dollars to be made against all of the vitriol that comes against the hip hop community, people will start rapping, right? Um, back to the sports world, I, I use the example of Nike. When Colin Kaepernick was at the height of the conversation, they hopped on and said, okay, we haven't <laughs> done this before, but because everybody's on this activism tip, we're going to come in and, and, and build this commercial around him. And I believe that, honestly, it was mostly performative by them. Now, we had this conversation earlier. Does the performance, even though it's mostly performative, does it take away from the necessity of these type of organizations to become involved in these topics? That's a hard one to say no to. Um, the goal is that they actually do something about it. And I've talked to some executives at Nike with a lot of the consultant work that I do, but it's very performative at this point because they, they were like, instead of 
me dissecting the things that they're trying to do. They just wanted me to say, oh, I approve what you're doing. Go forward with it. I wasn't going to do that. And they said, okay, uh, we're going to move into another direction. <laughs> and so, yes, I believe that a lot of these movements by the brands, by the corporations, are much so in the moment. But the, account, the accountability aspect comes into how can we keep the pedal to the metal and push them to be, you know, accountable for all these things they say they want to do, for the community development stuff they say they want to do, and all that. So I'll give one more example. The Los Angeles Clippers are building an arena in Inglewood. And Inglewood already have a problem with SoFi Stadium. But the, the Steve Ballmer says that this is going to be a 100% carbon-free arena. There's not going to be any pollution. You know, we're going to create jobs. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is build over a thousand bathrooms <laughs> in this arena so you can stay in tune with the game, all this type of stuff. But again, how is this going to be possible? What measures are you taking to do this? It's all secretive. We got to hold them accountable. And again, for me, that's why I'm working to try to build that framework to, to hold them accountable, to involve the communities when they make these decisions, um, to build these sort of collaborative type of initiatives and things like that and, and, and test them and evaluate them. And if they don't work, revise and re-implement. So that's the hope, but very performative for me now. That's okay. Um, so a lot of us here tonight are um, educators, like middle and high school teachers. Sure. And I'm wondering, like, if there's a, a couple things or one thing that, you know, involving the youth into this conversation, because they're, you know, you know, what should we be exposing them to? Or what do you think is something that they can look towards or to find inspiration or motivation to like keep fighting because we've been talking a lot about how they're just so desensitized to all these social movements and they think it's beyond them but i'm wondering like i don't know what do you think about that Ooh. um <laughs> yeah it's, that's why we all laughed when you said you were trying to do more than trying this comes to me we were with you yeah, <laughs> you try you know hey, hey let me first say hey Kudos to you all. Physical okay. education right here. Oh, hey, there you go. <laughs> mm. That is a, that is an excellent question. Now, the, the unfortunate thing about our society is that black kids, other marginalized kids, are having to see things that they shouldn't have to see. Okay, um, they have to grow up. Um, when they just should be in a place where they should have fun and uh, do those types of things. Um, you know, of course, not only with just doing your best to educate them on what's out there, but also, you know, what are the possibilities? Because I know back in my day, um, the community pushed us into channeling our anger and all that stuff about playing sports and, and all this stuff. Um, but nobody ever taught us how to be owners, um, not just sport teams, but entrepreneurs, um, where we can do the things that we need to do to come back and build our communities as they, they grow up and become better. I think um, for a lot of kids, they, they can only take in so much, of course, but a, a lot of exposure to the possibilities of what they could have in their future, I think could be um, something that's good. How to do that, you know, um, I, I'm not sure. But, you know, I know a lot of kids, and, and I used to do some speaking at some high schools. I remember talking to this one student who wanted to be a fashion designer, but she told me that I was the only person that believed in her because her whole family was like, get a real job. Go, get, go be a nurse or something like that. And you could just see the heartbreak in her 
But to have somebody tell her that, you know, no, you can do this. These are some of the things you need to look into, you know, when you're applying for school, stuff like that. You know, I, I know this is a high school kid, but something that can relate to them in that vein, I think would help. Um, unfortunately, you can't win them all, you know, but the ones you can help, you, know, you can try to do your best. Is that? Yeah. yeah okay. I am going to use my Okay. <laughs> but I wanted you to touch on her blood um, and his impact on um, really free agency and really opening up that, again, back to having the agency of that athlete and determining your future <laughs> and, and, and your prerogative yeah. um, and being able to move, right? Uh, team to team. So if you can talk about that impact of her and how he really laid on the line because so many and he doesn't get mentioned. Yeah, and you know that's the thing about it because all of these leagues that have a player like Kirk Flood who tries to change the game, who tries to understand the business side of it, um, to push the agenda for for players' rights, usually get ostracized. Okay, and um, I think of him. I think of uh, Mahmoud Abdul Raoul. I think about um, Craig Hodges. Um, you know, they were in an era where the leagues were like, either you do it my way or you're out of here. But I think Kirk Flood's legacy has shown up in some of the athletes of today. Um, there is this one offensive lineman named Laramie Tonsil. And I don't know if you all know about his story, but on draft day, somebody leaked a video of him with like this gas mask on of him smoking weed. And so that dropped his draft stock. Okay. But he still was a great player, um, played for the Miami Dolphins, got traded to the Houston Texans. He represents himself in negotiations and negotiated the highest earning contract for an offensive lineman today. And so all of that is sort of credited back to the Kirk Floods, the, the Craig Hodges of the world. Um, that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about. Not a lot of people talk about athletes developing agency because they want athletes to believe that your structure, your, your, your concept, your being should be at the behest of somebody else, right? And so the more that we see the legacy of Kurt Flood sort of infiltrate sport, I think we'll, we will see that, that, that sort of agency build upon itself. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, yeah. Just kind of following up on that and, and um, around having the agency. Yeah. Um, I've been trying my best to get Nicole in here on campus, but that hasn't worked out. But one of the things that she talks about, she is a, a black woman who is an NFL agent, first NFL agent. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that she really talks about is stepping into that space and really taking on the status quo. And um, around those contract negotiations and trying to get the best deals and really not having really push back against that status quo. So even not negotiating for yourself, but having someone else who can step into that and how important the diversity in that field is to really try to get up and, and get a support of players and get the, a fair shot in that in that um, negotiating arena. Yeah, you know, um, because, you know, she represents Jalen Hurts. Uh, as you all know, Philadelphia Eagles, Eagles quarterback. I thought they were going to win that, but I digress. Um, she, I hear his, his talks um, when he's talking about his finances, what he purchases, how he manages his money, what he invests in. Um, he talks about how I, I think he lives in like a condo right now, you know, nothing lavish, um, but it's earning him equity. You know, all of that comes from agents like Nicole Lynn, who who sort of uh, run the gamut on um, the protection of athletes. OK, and she 
um, is, I think, an absolute beast when it comes to uh, negotiating deals, um, setting the promotion and marketing of these players. You know, um, Jalen Hurts, in many cases, he rose from obscurity. Um, he wasn't. He played at the University of Alabama, got benched, went to the University of Oklahoma, was a second round draft pick by the Philadelphia Eagles. They didn't really want him. They were trying to get rid of him, but he worked hard and they are where they are now. And she was one of the people that helped him together, you know, through that process. And she is teaching him and other athletes um, again, about how to leverage their platform for, for other things and other causes um, that not only helps the communities, but it keeps their wallets from being leased from. So she's an incredible, incredible. I would love to interview her and, you know, for like future books and stuff. Yeah. We have time for maybe two more questions. I'll start. Um, what is one for you? First of all, I have to apologize. I have to leave after this answer. You're good. It's not as sick. I want to go help with that time. Oh, absolutely. Um, one thing I feel like we haven't talked about is the silence of white male athletes. Yes. And I want to separate this from women because I think a lot of white women, female athletes have done a lot of stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I feel like on one hand, maybe I can mention the white male athletes that have stood up and said something, so not just participate, but said something. And I, and personally, I feel like I don't know the major table athletes that time, and there's not pressure from those athletes. But I don't know if you address that in your book or if you have thoughts on that. If, that, if you see that as maybe a turning point, you know, at some point, I would push it so much. I don't talk about that, but I do research on that. I talk about this Tom Brady thing where T.O., Terrell Owens, would be on the sidelines and he would yell and try to motivate his players. They would say that he's a disruptor. He is a team obliterator. That's what Skip Bayless called him. But when Tom Brady does that, oh, he's a leader. You should believe in him because, you know, he's the winning way. And we see him yelling. It referees on the sideline where we see players getting fined for that. He's doing that. He's breaking these uh, iPad looking things all the time, you know, when he was playing. I think there's a double standard in, again, how sports media perceives these athletes. And then that turns into, well, Tom Brady doesn't have to protest. He doesn't have to engage because why? What? He's not going to lose anything. Before he was finished with his career, he signed a $300 million broadcasting deal that was more than his salary that he's ever earned in the NFL. He's untouchable in many cases. And I think that's why many of the white male athletes that you're talking about, why? why? They, they, will, they will stand to lose more in saying things, and they may lose a little bit in not, but they'd rather go with the latter. Because I'm not getting involved. I'm not going to touch that. Um, I, I don't have to care. And that's the unfortunate thing about that. And so I think that's another rampant problem, too, as you bring up that point. I mean, I, I think you could argue that they, while they could lose more, they also have you know, a privilege that they might not lose more. Yes, yeah. I think the fact that they don't see that the joint cause is a problem. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because Aaron Rodgers can sit and talk about all the shrooms he's on and, you know, <laughs> slick his hair back and grow that mustache and he can do whatever he wants. Uh, and, and that's, they know that they can get away with that. And that's, that's why they do it. Yeah. Thank you so much. No problem. Thanks for the question. And just um, if anyone is maybe interested in Dr. Anderson's book, um, there is a sign up. Please um, sign your name and your email. The book is thirty four dollars. Let's whole purchase it, and then we will uh, reach out to you when it's here. Feel free to do that. Um, to the last question, it'll be almost a two part question. Um, your work focuses not just on the U.S. but globally. Um, are the fundamental issues the same across cultures? Um, or do you think the U.S. is distinct in how sports intersect and how? And then my question is just after you answer that, if there's any additional parting words that you have for our students, please pull. Okay. There's the NFL International Series. I'm just going to use them as an example. 
and they've been trying to build a fan base in the UK for years. And prior to COVID, I was working with a team at the University of London about a research project relative to the NFL's infiltration into the country. And I was just, when I was there, randomly going around asking people, what do you think about the NFL establishing themselves here? And overwhelmingly so, they were saying that we don't want American culture to infiltrate what we have here. It's imperialism. You know, we think they have their own thoughts about America anyway. Um, but when the Black Lives Matter movement began, you know, they created a UK um, uh, aspect of it. Bless you. Bless you. And many of the issues that were going on in, in the US, um, a lot of the racism and all that stuff was happening there, particularly in this community called Tottenham. That's where the NFL plays the most of its games now. Um, it is the most global city pretty much in the country. And um, all of them, just like in cities like Inglewood and others in the United States are saying, we're going to lose all of our culture if this league comes in here. Um, the NFL is trying to establish themselves in Germany, in China, and in Africa. If you go on the NFL's website and you look at the jobs, there are several positions that are opening for what they call the NFL Africa movement. And like many other countries that have taken from the continent, uh, what is their purpose there? Because it's going to be hard to schedule those types of games if you're trying to establish something in those countries. They say that they're trying to build a fan base. I think most of those other countries are right. It's, it's, like, it's sort of an imperialistic mentality that's going into those spaces. And so what I believe the NBA has done to make themselves a little bit better is the embracing of the different cultures into the game. So we have Nikola Jokic, who's multi multi uh, NBA MVP, um, European player, you know, and the NBA is trying to build that sort of global community, whereas the NFL doesn't. So those are the challenges that we're seeing with, with that sort of global movement. And what I would part with is that. I bet a lot of you all didn't know how much sports have an impact on society, on larger conversations, on social justice, on um, racial inequity, on police brutality. It was something that was a part of the fabric of this country for over 160 years. And so to say that we need to get rid of sport and politics is to say that we need to get rid of our history. Because it's ingrained. And so I want to, again, just end with the, the sport justice movement is a representation of sport and politics continuing their marriage. Okay. And until we see true change, which may not be in our lifetime, I don't know, sports is here to stay. That's it. Uh, the Black Athlete <laughs> The Sport Justice Movement in the Age of Black Lives Matter. <laughs> All right, absolutely.